Oh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, reverse engineering on vintage computers um, for hopefully fun and profit. Uh, uh, I'm going to be posting just in case these slides are illegible because I didn't really try them at projector resolution. I'll be posting them somewhere. Um, you can uh, catch me on Twitter or email me. Uh, take a picture if you want, whatever. Uh, but uh, if you want to find the slides later, um, they'll be available. So, um, about me, I'm an embedded engineer. I've been uh, building uh, embedded devices for some definition of the term for a long time. I do a lot of hardware, software, and FPGA work. Um, I'm also, as you might be able to guess since I'm here, uh, a vintage computer aficionado. Uh, my preferred architectures, I like vintage Macs, 68K and PowerPC. I like PDP 11s. I like 6502 machines of all sorts. Uh, and 6809s, um, which are not as common. Um, but I'm definitely not qualified to instruct on this, but no one else signed up. So here we are. Uh, I have a long history of taking things apart. Uh, I was the coolest kid. Um, it, this is me in high school taking apart a friend's Sega Genesis at a party, uh, because that's what the cool kids did. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot you can do just by poking at things. I think in this case, the video is off, and I'm going to talk about the things you should maybe do up front so you're not going down rabbit holes, and in this case, I think you even need to take the thing apart because it turned out there was a broken connection in the cable. It would have been easier to check first. So an important part of vintage computing, or of uh, reverse engineering, is triage of what you actually need to do. So the agenda for this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about what reverse engineering is, uh, especially you know, what different types of it are. Um, we're going to talk about the preliminary steps you want to do before you actually start taking things apart. Um, we're going to talk about interactive disassembly techniques and tools. Um, and then if there's time, which I think there should be, I'll do a quick example and demo if things cooperate. Um, <laughs> I finally got the demo stuff together last night, and I'm not 100% sure I'm going to remember uh, exactly how I wanted to do it. So we'll see. Um, so what is reverse engineering? Uh, the short answer is taking things apart to see how they work. Um, that can be hardware. That can be software. Um, especially in vintage computing, it's often a combination. So if you're reverse engineering something for a modern PC or a server application, you don't really have to think much about the hardware that it's on. But in the vintage world, since so much was purpose-built for the hardware, let's say you're reverse engineering something for an Apple II. A lot of, all Apple II software is going to be directly driving a lot of the hardware, like the disk drive and the um, video controller and everything else. So in vintage computing, you usually need to know a fair amount about the, the machine that it's hosted on if you're taking part the software. And if you're taking part the machine, it is often also very helpful to know about the software that would be running on it. Um, so uh, you can kind of bridge the boundaries. Uh, I only have an hour. I'm mostly going to talk about software, but I am, again, with the vintage, I'm going to be touching on the hardware because it's kind of unavoidable. Uh, so what are the risks in uh, reverse engineering? So is it safe? Usually. Um, <laughs> uh, so. If you're reverse engineering high voltage things like tube amps or CRT monitors, you can get a nasty shock, you can die. Um, even if you're reverse engineering software, if you're reverse engineering, let's say, a device driver that uh, controls hardware that could potentially be dangerous, you can start a fire. Um, you can break expensive things. There's the, the famous story um, about the, the scratch monkeys. There's um, there was a research lab that had a PDP-11 that controlled some research uh, hardware that was hooked up to rhesus monkeys. And the Jack Field Service uh, representative came and ran the test while the machine was still hooked up to the monkeys and electrocuted them. And the lesson there was to always mount a scratch monkey when uh, doing diagnostics. Um, so, yeah, it can be dangerous. Especially in the software realm, it's usually not. Uh, so obviously, take appropriate precautions. Uh, the other risk, of course, is, is it legal? Uh, again, the answer is also usually. Um, so with software, that's 
sometimes a more difficult question to answer. They come with licenses which may or may not be enforceable, but you probably don't want to end up on the wrong end of a lawsuit even if you think you can win it because it can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, I'm not a lawyer, so my best advice is to tread carefully. If there is a license, however unenforceable you might think it might be, that says you can't uh, reverse engineer this thing, don't tell anyone you did it. Um, <laughs> But otherwise, especially with hardware, usually if you own it, you can take it apart. Uh, you might break it, but in general you're not legally enjoined from taking apart your own hardware. Uh, also, companies, especially defunct ones, aren't usually going to sue you uh, if you're not harming their commercial interests. Uh, but, some do anyway, because their lawyers want to make sure that they're protecting whatever they can. Uh, some companies have a funny idea of what might harm their financial in uh, commercial interests. And actually, one thing I left off is sometimes commercial interests revive. So a decade ago, the general theory was it's not commercially harming Nintendo if you're doing um, NES emulation, something like that. But now that Nintendo has Virtual Console on its consoles and they can sell all these old NES and Super Nintendo games and everything else again, they are getting back on, you know, trying to keep people from at least getting a bunch of stuff for free. So. You know, tread carefully. The general idea is um, if you're going to do it and you think it might not be legal, try and keep it under your hat. Uh, so, why should you take apart your hardware or software? Um, oh man, that got cut off. Oh well. Uh, so, most frequently, curiosity. Uh, most of you probably wouldn't be here today if you weren't quite curious people. It's pretty common in vintage computer people because otherwise, why would you be interested in computers we don't commonly use anymore? Um, it's fun to find out about how things work or worked, uh, and learn new techniques in the process. We can actually learn a lot from vintage computers in hardware and software. There's a lot of things that were done, you know, in the 70s where we're kind of reinventing the wheel with Linux now, like clustering and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's nice to find out about these things. Um, but most usefully, it can be very useful for fixing things. So, uh, you know, if something isn't working or you want to do something that it wasn't designed to do, uh, you know, let's say you want to make your Furby uh, shout X with something like that. Um, you know, it, it could, maybe that's not useful, <laughs> but, uh, but you can do it. Uh, so, you know, troubleshooting guides that come with your hardware or software, they'll only cover the common simple problems that they expect customers to run into. But if you run into a weird corner case, or you think something could be useful for doing something, but it's just not quite working, if you dig a little deeper, sometimes you can figure out how to do it. Um, vintage hardware obviously breaks, um, because it's old. Everything breaks eventually. Um, sometimes vintage software gets corrupted, even if it's something posted up somewhere, it might have been a corrupted uh, archive. There's definitely some uh, Fortran archives for uh, RSX 11 that are corrupted online. It would be great to figure out how to fix those. Um, there's latent bugs in long dead software that can be fixed if you know how. Um, and I'm actually going to cover that as my example if we get the time. Um, so, you know, if you've got something that you actually use and it's not working right, you can fix it. So, preliminary steps for reverse engineering. The things you do before you actually start opening up. Um, so, getting into the hardware. Um, I said I'm going to talk mostly about software, but again, especially with vintage stuff, uh, that's usually going to require some interaction with the hardware, and it may not be readily accessible. So you might not be able to get what you want to get through conventional methods. You know, if you're running on, say, PDP-11, and you have access to the system, you can probably, you know, copy the, the software over however you want. But if you're trying to get the firmware of a PDP-11 card, it could be a different question. So there are a few ways to get into the hardware to figure out what's going on, uh, how you're going to dig it out. Serial ports are a common one. Um, even in modern electronics, there's usually serial ports exposed of some sort. They might be full RS-232, they might be at TTL or CMOS levels, but because they're such convenient debug ports, they're still very, very common. And they were still very common um, in the 70s and later when, when UARTs became actually affordable. Um, ROMs, obviously, can be dumped. Again, with the NES, you can open up a cartridge and dump those ROMs and um, figure out what to do with them. That also goes for things like flash, um, EEPROMs, other persistent storage for uh, vintage devices. Uh, if, you, if neither of those work, 
you can sit on the processor bus with something like a logic analyzer. That's certainly a lot easier with vintage machines than with modern machines, because modern machines have very complex buses. Vintage buses tend to be very straightforward, um, single-ended logic that, that you can sit on with a logic analyzer. Um, maybe build an adapter card if it's a backplane bus, or if, like on old Macs, you could stick uh, an adapter into the cache slot, that sort of thing. Um, on newer devices that could still be considered vintage, um, because as time goes on, newer and newer things are older and older. Um, you know, the thing is, back to, say, the 90s, there's debug ports like JTAG, which is a very common uh, debug bus for uh, a lot of devices. It was originally built as a, a testing bus for testing that you actually had all the pins connected on your circuit board, but they also realized, hey, you can upload and download the programs through it, and um, that's a very common way of debugging processors. BDM also is sort of the Motorola um, pre-JTAG debug, the background debug mode for uh, a couple of their processor generations. And if all else fails, there's nitric acid, um, <laughs> which you probably shouldn't do at home. But if you were doing, let's say, corporate espionage, or actually, again, bringing the Nintendo back into it, if you're looking how to emulate proprietary chips with unpublished data, and you really don't have any other uh, way to figure out how they work. You can always just dissolve them one layer at a time, figure out where the transistors are, and have them out, and um, work it out from that. But nitric acid isn't safe, and you shouldn't do that unless you absolutely know what you're doing. Uh, so, before you really start going down the rabbit hole of you know, disassembling something large, etc., you should do a little bit of homework to see what's already available that can help you out. So one nice thing about vintage computers is that often they were, at least when they were built, very well documented. They were simple enough to, to understand, um, and they were big enough that you could actually fix things. Um, they weren't all consolidated onto a couple of chips. Uh, and they, their designers wanted people to be able to use them, so they documented the architecture. So you know, deck computers are a fantastic example of this, and fortunately all their documentation, well not all of it, but a lot of their documentation is still fairly well preserved. So you can go to bit savers and get full architecture manuals for PDP-11s, PDP-10s, faxes, that sort of thing, um, and you can read up on how the entire machine works before you start fiddling around with things. And it might even answer the question that you're looking for, and you don't have to go through the exercise of breaking everything down. Uh, service manuals are also often very helpful, especially because they often include schematics. And sometimes the schematics are a little bit obfuscated because they don't want people to copy it or figure out certain parts. But certainly, for at least figuring out if something's not working, um, they can be very helpful. Um, diagnostic tools, <coughs> too. Um, a lot of those machines, because the components broke frequently, have complex uh, diagnostic modes that can tell you a lot of things about, about what's happening in the machine which can be useful for either fixing it or figuring out, again, what's going on. Uh, if you're lucky, there might even be theory of operation guides. So cipher tape drives, for example, have fairly substantial theory of operation guides that describes how the entire tape drive works available online. So if you wanted to make your own tape drive, you could read that and get some ideas. Uh, of course, and I think Jason Scott's going to be here uh, this weekend, but uh, he'll tell you, uh, documents always are getting lost long ago, or even recently, to accidents, fairly storage, or lawyers who demanded that they be destroyed. Uh, it's sad. Um, once, they're, once they're gone, gone, they're not coming back unless someone uh, reverses it out of something. But uh, in a lot of cases, especially with the major companies, that documentation uh, survives today and can be very useful. So do your homework up front. Do the thorough search for the documentation. Uh, See if someone has already answered your question. You know, how does this thing work? Can I break into it? Can I overwrite the firmware? Can I do that sort of thing? Uh, the internet is full of people who like to break things. So th there's a good chance that if you're going to do something, someone else has either done it or done something that will get you far on your way to achieving your goal. Uh, there's no need to rediscover the wheel if it's already documented unless you want to, because sometimes it's good to just practice it. So. Your problem is still not solved. How are you going to attack it? Uh, let's say you couldn't find anything online relating to the thing that you wanted, or you're doing something that no one else has tried before. 
So let's say if you have a board that's not working, try to get it. Use your senses, use your intuition. Don't use all your senses. Try not to taste things, um, uh, especially batteries. Is, so is the hardware totally dead? Sometimes things aren't dead, but are locked up. And you can sometimes tell the difference. You can probe around with an oscilloscope if you've got one. And if you don't have one, scour you may for a decent cheap one um, to see if you can find anything moving. Um, you know, look at look at the chip data sheets for uh, the device you have. See where clocks ought to be on the pins of the devices. Start probing around to see if maybe you're missing clocks somewhere. Because sometimes, especially clock oscillators, if they were stored in bad environments, they'll get moisture or other things in there, and they'll just stop running. You can fix a broken board just by replacing the clock oscillator. Um, look for data bus lines, other things that ought to be moving, and see if they are. And that's a good way to see if the board is totally dead or just malfunctioning. Um, sniff around to see if the magic smoke's been let out somewhere. That's usually a pretty obvious thing, although if it was done long ago, sometimes it, there's no residual smell. Uh, feel around uh, carefully to see if anything's getting unreasonably hot. A lot of old uh, TTL chips, for example, just die to old age relatively quickly. Um, so uh, memory chips, too. Um, if you get an old arcade board with 4116s, there's a good chance that you're going to have dead chips, and probably a lot of them. Partly because they got hot, but then when they die, they get even hotter a lot of the time. So that's often a good, or unreasonably cold. If there's something that ought to be warm and isn't, that could be a sign that something else is wrong, like a cut power line or a pocket's not getting through. <clears throat> Don't taste anything. Um, check for failed batteries and capacitors. Um, vintage machines are infamous for it. Batteries explode, especially when things are stored in attics or barns or garages because of the temperature changes. Uh, and they leak corrosive goo all over everything and make a big mess and um, destroy uh, chip leads and board traces. And oftentimes the damage is salvageable. Um, if you scrub it with a toothbrush with baking soda and alcohol, uh, it's usually uh, good for cleaning it up, but you may have to do some repair work on traces or leads. Um, sometimes it seeps under things and destroys vias and other things, and that's a little hurt. Uh, capacitors also um, fail in interesting and sometimes spectacular ways. Um, anyone who has plugged in an older machine straight out of someone's attic may be familiar with the exploding tangled capacitors uh, problem. Um, when they dry out, because um, uh, electrolytic capacitors have a liquid electrolyte, when they dry out, they become much more resistive, and so the inrush current heats them up and Tantalum capacitors and some older aluminum ones didn't have vents in them, so when they heat up that much, they can actually explode. They can take out traces or parts of your board or your eyes if you're not careful. So again, caution. Uh, so like I said, because I only have an hour, I'm mostly going to be talking about um, the software end of things with you know some necessary uh, concessions to the hardware because we are talking about computers and you need to know about both. So I'm going to be talking largely about interactive disassembly uh, and the tools used to do it, uh, and then the techniques will follow that. So, um, so software reverse engineering. Um, the general principle here is disassemble the program, map out its execution, so you can turn this blob of you know, binary data into something that you can read and understand how it works. Um, which probably doesn't actually sound that simple, but it's not as simple as it sounds. Um, simple disassembly can be done in a single pass sometimes, uh, but it doesn't always yield a lot of helpful info. Uh, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, first, of course, if you're disassembling something that didn't come with any symbols, there's no names attached to anything. So you just get function one, function two, function three, function four. If you're getting a binary from an operating system, you might have a name, so you know where to start, but uh, you don't get the names of anything else. Same with um, uh, data objects, uh, symbols, references to strings and numbers and anything else. Uh, but we certainly disassembled programs in the 70s on green bar paper, so single pass disassembly, uh, you know, often enough is as good as a program listed without any annotations. Uh, so it can be done, it will usually not be a great use of your time though. Uh, so interactive disassembly techniques yield the best results. 
So what is interactive disassembly? Um, it's, it's a way of directing the disassembler uh, to produce more useful results uh, than just guessing. So if you just run a disassembler over a program, often enough it'll start at the program entry point and proceed. Uh, but it doesn't always, depending on the disassembler especially, it doesn't always know uh, what to look for. So um, an interactive disassembler is most useful for binary reverse engineering where you don't have any other information. It follows the program flow from the start point, so it's not just kind of going down the list and disassembling the programs. It's following all the branches, it's following all the data references, and labeling, hey, this is a number, this looks like a string, um, this is a function, that's a function, this, if you're lucky and have a good disassembler, it might identify junk tables, uh, things like that. And it also lets you uh, further refine that, so not just relabeling things, um, like uh, labeling functions and data references, putting comments in, but also some of the things that the disassembler can't guess at. So jump tables are a particularly difficult thing because you can't always tell when something is a jump table if your disassembler isn't particularly good at following. Lots of processors have different ways of doing, for example, indirect jumps uh, that can be confusing to uh, a disassembler. And it also doesn't always know what the bounds of that table are. If you're just jumping off an arbitrary number that gets passed in, it could be you know one or two things, or it could be four billion, uh, and your disassembler doesn't necessarily know, and usually can't guess. Uh, but sometimes you can uh, tell it things like that, so you dig it out. Um, so tools, there are several interactive disassemblers out there. Uh, some of them are free and open source, uh, and some of them are very expensive. Um, they all have benefits and drawbacks over each other, and especially when it comes to esoteric or vintage CPUs. Because most, especially most commercial disassemblers these days are targeted towards modern processors, because that's where companies are actually going to be paying money for them. Uh, but there are exceptions, especially ones that have rich heritage. So, the classic one is IDA Pro. That one is sort of bog standard for all sorts of interactive disassembly. Um, especially in things like malware research. Um, but it has a long history. It was originally a DOS program. It, and it has a huge selection of CPUs um, and binary format parsers. So, you know, PDP 11, it'll even um, parse out, uh, I think, RT11.save files. Uh, Alpha 6502, PowerPC, dozens and dozens of processors. It supports lots of things, and you can write your own plugins for most interactive disassemblers. You can write your own plugins for handling other CPUs. Uh, but it is expensive uh, for hobby purposes. If you're a company that actually does this for a living, it's a no-brainer. You're going to pay 1400 bucks a year. Well, actually, the renewal is less. You're going to pay 1400 bucks per seat, and that's just going to be the cost of doing business. Uh, for hobbyists, it's not great. There is a free tier now, but it only does x86, which for most of us, if you're into DOS games, that could be fine. For a lot of us here, that's not going to cover a lot of our use cases. Um, still, uh, you know, the it's cheaper than it used to be. The starter one covers about a third of the CPUs, and it's the most common subset of what's used. Uh, and it omits the more complex ones like Alpha and PowerPC. Um, oddly enough, it doesn't have VAX, so if you're looking for a VAX disassembler, I still haven't found one. Um, but that's IDA. That was, that's kind of the, the, I wouldn't call it a gold standard because it's a cranky program, but it does the job. Uh, Radari 2, um, I think that's how you pronounce it, um, is a newer open source disassembler. It is free, it's open source, um, but it is free, which means it's not always great. It's kind of funky. Um, I actually kind of like using it in a lot of ways better than IDA, and part of that's because it has VI key bindings, um, which I find more convenient. But um, especially on more esoteric architectures, it has problems. Like it supports PowerPC, but it doesn't do a lot of the things that you really need a PowerPC disassembler to do due to some quirks of the architecture. And of course, given the time, I'd love to contribute some of those uh, functions and make it more fully fledged, but um, I don't have the time, and it seems like not many other people do either. Um, it does cover a lot of CPUs, not nearly as many as Ida does, but I would say, at least from what I saw the other day, it was a, a couple dozen. Um, 
uh, or a dozen or so. Um, most of these disassemblers cover at least 6502 because everyone loves disassembling Apple II and, and Nintendo programs um, and Commodore, uh, but uh, this includes that. Uh, but again, it is free, it is improving rapidly, it has a very active development community, so uh, new things are always going in uh, and it is always getting better. Uh, Mac Nosy and the debugger are very specific to, to Mac reverse engineering. They're classic Mac programs, pre-OS X, um, from a guy named Steve De Jassic. They were pretty much the, um, the shining star of third-party developer tools um, for, for Macs in the 80s and 90s. Um, the, the Mac Nosy is an interactive disassembler, uh, very much in the vein of IDA. Um, and the debugger is a low-level debugger, much like Maxbug. Um, it replaces Maxbug if you ever do much uh, vintage Mac development or uh, debugging. So they're really excellent at disassembling 68K and PowerVC code uh, and working with Mac idiosyncrasies in ways that Ida Pro can't. So resource forks, for example, the 68K Macs especially kept all their code in the resource forks in code resources. Ida Pro doesn't have a way of dealing with that at all unless you were to extract it yourself and map it to the memory or anything else. So MacNosy understands all that, can handle that. Um, it also comes with CoverCast if you're developing new vintage Mac programs for code coverage. Um, and the debugger does not work under Classic. Um, so you need an actual real iron machine to run the debugger. But unless you're actually doing the debugging, MacNosy will probably do for your uh, needs. Um, so this is still available actually from Steve Jassic. It cost $1,500 when it was new in the 80s and 90s, which was a lot more back then. But um, he sells the, 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 the whole set for 99 bucks. Um, and it can be difficult to get in touch with, but you send him PayPal and that'll attract his attention. <laughs> so, <laughs> imagine, money talks. Uh, Binary Ninja is another one that I was actually just introduced to at a conference about two weeks ago. Uh, and it's actually very compelling. It's quite new. Uh, it's really only come about in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it is a commercial product. Um, it's gaining a lot of traction in the malware research community because it has a number of features that are very handy for that. Um, and it supports a lot of modern processors. Um, it's cheaper than Ida Pro by a substantial amount, 150 bucks for a personal license that doesn't have much in the way of limitations, uh, $600 for commercial, and they also have an enterprise tier. There's also a free tier, but again, that one I think is restricted to only x86, but I can't quite remember. Uh, it's very scriptable, so if you're trying to automate uh, your disassembly of things, again, that's something much more useful for uh, malware researchers, for example, but if you have a lot of vintage programs that you want to automate your disassembly of, uh, it's, it's extremely scriptable uh, and useful for that. Um, and in fact, all of its plugins for um, the uh, disassembly and everything else are Python scripts. Um, it has relatively few processes in binary formats compared to IDA and Radare, but it is also newer. Um, it's also very extensible, and there's a lot of community plug uh, developed plugins for both the processors and binary formats. Um, it also does, it, it has a neat approach to disassembly, which is it lifts to higher level intermediate languages. So it takes the raw disassembly, it converts that into its low level intermediate language, which is basically saying, okay, this assembler instruction does these little micro operations. It loads this register, it increments this one, it uh, sets these status flags, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there's a higher level one that brings it almost to a C level, except everything is named with register names, um, that sort of thing. But um, it can be very useful for seeing things at a higher level than just a straight up disassembler. Uh, Hopper is another new one. I actually haven't used it, um, uh, but a number of people have recommended it to me. Uh, it is Mac and Linux specific, there's no Windows one. And, and as shipped, it only supports uh, x86 and 64-bit uh, ARM v6 plus, so really new ARMs, uh, and PowerPC. But it is extensible. Um, there's actually quite a few community plugins for uh, vintage processors like 6502, TMS 1000, and others, plus other binary formats like um, NES files, uh, Commodore 64 disks, uh, that sort of thing. Um, 
it, it's definitely improving. It has a very nice interface, which differentiates it from a lot of um, the other disassemblers. And it's fairly reasonably priced. Uh, 100 bucks for a personal non-node-lock license is not bad. Um, and 129 for node lock, and I think that's really just the tax for this is going to be used by corporations. Um, so, uh, so much for tools. There's others too, but those those are the ones uh, that were at the forefront of my mind. There's probably other specialized ones for other things. Amigas, I, I think there's a, a disassembler for them. There's a couple others for other architectures. Um, I know some of the 68K Mac guys use a different free disassembler for um, disassembling ROM files as well. It's not Mac OS or IDA, but I don't know what it is. Uh, so techniques. Uh, now that you've decided you need to disassemble something, how do you proceed? So the first thing is you need to give it a, a starting point for the analysis. Um, if you start in the wrong location, if you just start from address zero, assuming you actually even have any code mapped at zero, um, especially on CISC machines, you can very easily start in the middle of it. Well, you wouldn't start in the middle of an instruction at address zero, but um, anywhere else. You can start in the middle of an instruction or in a string table or something like that and just disassemble garbage. And the disassembler is going to happily march on and say, oh, this is a jump to some weird place. This is an invalid opcode. I'm just going to skip it and kind of keep going on. You're not going to get anything useful out of it. You're going to get a whole lot of garbage that's going to be kind of hard to clean up later. So finding the proper starting point for analysis is important. Um, this is often easier than it might sound because the computer needs to know where to start executing as well. So most CPUs have well-defined reset and interrupt vectors. So if you're disassembling something that boots a bare metal machine, that's a good place to start. Look for those vectors. Um, in some architectures, that's just going to be an address that it jumps to. In other architectures, that's just going to be it starts there and starts executing. Um, this is even easier on executables because they specify their entry point. It says the start method or the start function is right here at this address. So load all this stuff into memory at these addresses and then start executing here. So most decent disassemblers will that can parse your uh, binary format will know to do that, uh, and that'll be where they automatically start. If you tell it to automatically start. Um, Often enough, you'll have to do this multiple times, especially for things like the exception vectors. So there might be a whole table of exception vectors, especially if it's hard-coded into a ROM, and the disassembler isn't necessarily going to know what to do with that. But of course, if you've got an exception vector, often enough that's something like an interrupt handler, and it's going to have critical stuff for driving peripherals, things like that. So you'll need to go through uh, exception vectors, um, and manually restart the analysis at those points. Sometimes you find code that the disassembler didn't really know how to get to, especially if it's through something like a jump table or a strange indirect um, uh, jump. Um, and so that's the whole point of interactive disassembly is you can kind of, as a human, be reading through the code saying, oh, you know what, I think it's actually taking this register and mangling it somehow uh, and then jumping to that address. Um, and you go to that address and say, all right, let's start analyzing here. Um, so you set it on its way. If you have a particularly big program, it can take a while to do this analysis because it's essentially emulating the processor very slowly um, by, by determining what the processor is actually supposed to be doing and doing that and noting down stuff along the way. And usually with most disassemblers, that's going to result in a whole bunch of randomly named functions and references and if you have a nice one, it'll see strings and at least name the strings something that looks like what the string is. Um, so that's your start point. So now you have a great big pile of subroutines and data. What do you do with it? Well, that's where the hard work begins. So even a small program uh, can be quite a lot of code. So for example, a 100 kilobyte PowerPC executable, PowerPC instructions are fixed four bytes. So it could contain as many as 25,000 instructions, uh, and you have to understand them and how they flow and what they do. Um, sometimes you'll get lucky, and it'll include the symbol table. So if you're talking about Unix or VMS executables or something like that, um, if they're not ship stripped, especially if they're meant to be linked with other things later, um, the symbol table will be there and everything will be named for you. And that's really handy um, because then you can at least get a great indication of what to do. So as an example, 
I had a project where I was reverse engineering um, the, the Wii uh, system, uh, what the front menu was, the system menu. Um, that was a megabyte of PowerPC code. Uh, but Nintendo's engineers left a separate symbol table file there so that uh, any programs running that needed to, to link with stuff for the system menu could access it. And people in the homebrew community figured out the format of that symbol table and you could import it into item. So that made my job immensely easier because I didn't have to guess what functions were that I was looking for um, because they were then named. Um, uh, data too, it's nice to know what that data is instead of trying to guess at it based on what the uh, instructions are doing. Um, but usually, uh, usually you don't know what's going on. If you're reversing something that runs in an OS, um, Often enough, it'll make common syscalls. So you can you can tell what's calling open, read, write, uh, exit, exec, um, that sort of thing because it, it's known as syscall. And if your disassembler understands uh, your OS, it can even uh, sometimes have things like libraries. Um, dynamically imported libraries also uh, usually have names for the functions, so you can know what uh, functions are calling from uh, those names. Um, you want to learn some techniques for honing in on the code you're interested in because there's going to be a lot of it. Uh, you can just start from the entry point and follow it through to main and then see where it goes, but you may find yourself overwhelmed just by going into the stuff that sets up for main that copies all the memory into its appropriate places and initializes it and everything else. Um, so it usually makes more sense to uh, start from the middle. So string tables are a great way to do this. Um, if, if you have command line programs, especially because they're going to be printing things to the console, but even sometimes for GUIs, especially if they're uh, popping things up on dialogs, that sort of thing, um, you can find a lot of the strings just in the code. And the disassembler marks the locations of strings. It'll usually let you just see the table. Um, and the nice thing is, it also keeps track of the cross references. So, what code was pointing to this string? You know, who printed out the string that says, this is a vulnerable thing, I hope no one hacks this, or something like that. Um, or like, you know, this is the SSL connect method. If you're trying to figure out what kind of certificates it's using or where they might be stored, find that, find those strings and work your way backwards because you've got the cross references so you can see who's printing out that string. Um, you can also use that to identify, for example, oh, this unnamed function, this is the print method because Someone's always loading a string and a file descriptor right before they call that function. Um, things like that. So find the strings that interest you, see who called them, unwind up the cross-reference stack. So sometimes it's going to take a couple levels before you really figure out what's going on. But this is probably one of the best ways of approaching an unknown program if, there's a, if there are strings around so that you can identify functions, see what you're doing, and more importantly, get to what you want to know. Because if, if you see strings talking this is the authentication connection function. That's a, a really good way to find it. So then, once you've kind of caught a few footholds, you want to climb up the tree. Um, going from the inside out has advantages. You start, hopefully, from the place you're interested in if the string wasn't misleading, which happens. Um, you can label the low-level functions, like print functions, like I said, so that you can identify uh, those things. Also, I.O. functions and memory locations. If you're working with some hardware that you don't know about and haven't engineer the board, um, you can figure out some of the I.O. locations that way. So you can say, oh, this is where the serial port lives. And that can be very useful for finding other functions. Um, often debug strings will contain the real name of the function because they want to know what's calling those, uh, or printing those strings. So you can actually get a pretty good idea of what a lot of the functions are named uh, and build your knowledge of the functions that call them from that. Uh, dealing with unknowns. So, uh, Let's say you find a, what looks like an interesting piece of code that writes to some memory location. You think it's doing something you might be interested in, but you're not sure, and you don't know exactly what it does. So, you know, how do you figure that out? You find out what code references that function. So again, you have the cross-references. If there are a lot of cross-references, if this is something that's getting called a hundred times in your code, um, it's probably either something that's low level, or honestly, probably not something that's important all on its own, because then it would probably be called just once or twice. Uh, but, you know, the way things are called can tell you a lot about what it does. And you need to imagine yourself from the standpoint of a programmer uh, and what are the situations in which that happens.
Um, so you know, let's say you find you find a function that gets referenced by a print function that you've identified that could be the code for writing a serial port, that could be the code for loading up the format string. So if you're trying to find if you're trying to find a vulnerability in a program because uh, you're trying to get into some system, and format strings are a great way to do that. Uh, if you can look at how the format strings are are parsed and generated, you can you can find bugs in them and figure out how to break through. Um, so there are also some tricky things to break down. Um, so there are anti reverse engineering techniques that are used to foil dissection, even in vintage code, because reverse engineering has been a thing for a very long time. Um, as Nikola Tesla. Um, so, uh, you know, these days you see them a lot in malware. They're also definitely used in commercial code, especially copy protection DRM code. Um, but they've always been used to keep people from peeking around. Um, some examples, some unconventional branching methods. So, like I said, a lot of processors have a lot of different ways to go to different places in the code. The easy one is jump to this address. A slightly less direct one is load up this register, jump to this address. But you can make it really esoteric, you know, load this register, XOR it with some weird number, push it on the stack, and then pop it into the PC. Um, that is a perfectly valid way to jump to an address on a lot of processors, but an interactive disassembler isn't going to follow that very well. So you have to dissect that on your own uh, and figure it out with your own intuition. And <coughs> jump tables are actually kind of a, a, an example of that because not that particular one, but the previous one. You're loading a register, you're adding something to it, the disassembler doesn't necessarily know what you can add to it. It just knows that it's probably going to jump somewhere. Uh, and oftentimes you'll have to manually trace that down and, and do the um, analysis. Self-modifying code is fun. Uh, you won't find this as much in modern stuff just because um, a lot of modern emphasis is making code that can be, or data, memory that can be modified also not be executable because it keeps people from exploiting vulnerabilities by modifying the program code on the fly. But there is plenty of uh, code, especially in vintage machines, that is self-modifying, either because they were trying to save space or do something more clever than they should have done, uh, or because they wanted to mask its true intent. So there could be a function where it, it looks like something else that's somewhere else in the program, uh, something XORs a value over all that memory and turns it into different instructions. You're not going to be able to read that from uh, from the file. You're going to have to go in and say, "This doesn't look like it's doing what it's doing," and I found this other function that references it and writes a bunch of data over it. So what's you know going on? You're going to have to translate that. Um, there's a, an extension on that is packing things into data sections. So this can be done for compression. It can be done for obfuscation. In malware, it's very popular for both because when it's compressed. It doesn't follow, it, it can be A, if you've added some random stuff on it, it can be completely randomized, so really simple scanners aren't going to see things. Um, but also, the disassembler is just going to see, oh, it's a huge block of data that someone calls. But if you then tra trace the execution, you can see, well, it loads this data, and it passes it through gzip decompression, and dumps it in this memory area, and marks it executable, and jumps to it. So that means if you really want to find out what the program is doing, you have to dump that chunk of data unpack it, feed it back into your disassembler, um, and proceed from there. And some disassemblers will actually do that automatically, or they'll have plugins for that. Um, it, it's relatively uncommon. You usually have to do that by yourself. Um, there's virtual machines and, and bytecode interpretation. That's also used for compression. Um, Microsoft's original Office products on the Mac actually used bytecode mostly to keep the size down because they had to fit everything Uh, but it's also really great for foiling reverse engineering because you can make your instructions be whatever you want and no one's going to know it until they actually go through and dig. And if you're interested in something like this, if you follow Malware Tech Blog on Twitter, he actually posted uh, a neat little example of that that you can disassemble with the free version of Ida Pro that has a very simple virtual machine uh, where you have to pretty much figure out what it does and write your own little interpreter in Python figure out what it does and get the, the flag for the end result. Um, it's a neat exercise. You should try it. Um, and then, of course, there's encrypted or encoded strings to foil string table analysis. So 
Obviously, string tables give away a lot of, uh, about the program. A lot of people know that, and so they'll do things like encrypt the string, um, XOR it with something, because XOR is easily reversible. Could be encoded in base64 or compressed or something like that. Uh, and it's going to make your job a lot harder um, off the bat to, to figure out what's going on, because then you have to decrypt or decode each of these strings to, to figure out what's happening. Um, there's plenty of other things that, uh, that can be done. Exploiting weird undocumented opcodes, that was a favorite in some Nintendo games because the NMOS 6502 had both some bugs and undocumented opcodes that actually did things. Uh, and if your emulator doesn't emulate it bug for bug, there are uh, NES games that will crash and uh, other things like that. Um, they also broke when they moved to 65CO2, which fixed the bugs and uh, got rid of the unbalanced opcodes. Um, so, uh, lots of examples of things that can make your job a lot harder that you pretty much just have to apply elbow grease and intuition to. So, I am actually running reasonably ahead of schedule, so there's time for a brief demo uh, and just sort of an example. So, um, this isn't as bright as I'd hoped, but. Um, uh, so, an example of where this was extremely useful to me and why I really got into reverse engineering vintage stuff is, um, this might be a K11 SCSI card, it's a CMD CQD220, um, it's for QBUS PDP-11 machines, and if you're not interested in PDP-11, you can tune out for about two minutes while I talk about this. But uh, basically, it connects to the, the PDP-11's QBUS, um, and it bridges SCSI for hard drives and CDs and, and other things to um, a protocol that is compatible to a lot of DEC operating systems called MSCP, which is, um, you could think of it sort of as a local uh, iSCSI in a lot of ways. Uh, it's not actually over a network, but it was, it was a protocol for communicating instead of a hard disk controller thing. So this was a very common uh, SCSI card because it let you use SCSI devices, which there weren't any direct SCSI cards for PDP-11s, with a lot of DEC operating systems that were written for DEC's own disk drives. Um, in a completely compatible and transparent way. Uh, unfortunately, they're not really common on the ground now, and when you can find them, they're usually pretty expensive. So I got this, and uh, you know, I was using it for a little bit, and all of a sudden, it just stopped. It, you know, it was not talking to anything. It's got a little serial port here for uh, for diagnostics and configuration, and it can also talk to um, the PDP-11 uh, and run the program on that, but it was behaving very strangely. And what was very interesting to me about it was it was actually responding to commands from the host computer, and it was copying the diagnostic program. And the way it worked was it just had a diagnostic program stored in its memory, and you wrote a couple of commands to it, and it blasted that to your PDP-11 memory, and you would run it. Um, and it would, it would run that, but then it wasn't responding to any of the commands that were being sent. So I could immediately tell this thing is at least partially functional. The whole board's not dead. Um, nothing seems to have let out the magic smoke. Uh, but nothing's coming out the serial port. It's not responding to any of the commands. Something must be wrong. And I don't think it's a dead chip. So what to do? So I started basically probing around, making sure that everything still had its clocks. And as far as I could tell, everything did. And you can't see it from this picture because it's dimmer than I thought and also lower resolution. But a lot of these chips are semi-custom logic. They're PALs and PLAs and PEELs. Actually, all three. I think there's even some GALs on there. Um, uh, because this is a very complex board in a rather small package uh, before everyone was making their own custom chips. So it's full of some programmable logic that would be pretty much inscrutable um, if I were to try and figure out uh, what was going on. But there are a couple standard chips in there. And I was particularly interested in what are these things? You know, that looks an awful lot like probably a computer. And a thing with, you know, a lot of uh, peripheral cards from the mini computer era, and a lot of them are embedded computers themselves. Uh, there's restricted I.O. space. On um, PDP-11, you only get 8K of space to do all the I.O. registers on the card, so usually they have a very small aperture, and a lot of the smarts are actually pushed into the card, which uh, operates on so I was reasonably sure this was a computer. These definitely looked like ROMs. Um, and I figured this is probably a CPU. 
So I looked at a lot of the surrounding chips, and I recognized and was able to look up the data sheets for a number of the ones that were standard logic, including a number of uh, support chips that are very common with uh, Intel 8086 and 8088 uh, machines. So it was a reasonable bet that this was uh, you know, an Intel processor, 8086 or 8088, and going by, you know, I didn't go to the extreme of tracing out all the word traces and everything like that. It would have taken forever. But um, uh, given the number of support chips, I was reasonably confident it was an 8086. These are two 8-bit ROMs, so it's probably the even uh, ROM. So going from that, I can already construct a reasonable guess as to how this machine worked. Uh, and then the question was, OK, now what to do with it? So I looked up a couple things. Unfortunately, someone else uh, named Glenn Slick had already actually dumped the ROMs of his board because he had some other interesting things. So again, do your homework. Sometimes you'll get help where you didn't expect it. He'd already dumped those ROMs. Um, uh, he had more up-to-date ones than I did, so I grabbed his firmware, um, and I also dumped the firmware from mine because they were just standard uh, EPROMs uh, to do a comparison. And I burned I burned the stuff from him to some EPROMs I had. I put it in. It still didn't boot up. But it also still worked for the, um, the PDP-11 program. So I knew that at least that was sort of right. Um, so then, next thing I did, of course, was, all right, I've got these ROMs. Let's, uh, let's disassemble it. Uh, let's see what we can do to, to actually map it out. So uh, I'm going to give, in the nine minutes I have left, I think, eight minutes now, um, uh, quick demonstration of what that might look like, although I'm not really going to have the time to go through the whole thing, and it's been years since I did this, so I might be missing a few steps. So let's see, is this going to help? Let's see. All right. So, uh, starting from the point, let's see. Hopefully, you guys can read this. If not, I'm dreadfully sorry. Um, but uh, starting, oh boy, I think I'm going to read it. I think it works now. No, it's a little bit. Um, starting from the part where, uh, where I started, I have, uh, the, um, I have the firmware. I've uh, downloaded it here. So he actually has the firmware for a, a couple of different variants of the board because they had different work, ones that work with hate and this. Um, and since they're even and odd, you have to put them back together. Um, if you want to disassemble it, so they actually form the contiguous memory space instead of just the even bytes and the odd bytes. Some disassemblers will do that for you. If I did does it, I haven't figured out where. So I just wrote a quick uh, Python program to uh, to do it. Um, it basically just reads the even and reads the odd and interleaves them and writes them out. And it's not scalable at all, but it's also only like 10 lines. So who cares? You're only dealing with 8K of code. So, um, so then if I do uh, uh, stitcher.py on the one I'm looking for is the F220 Y, oops, Y1 A8.bin and the F220 uh, Y2 A8.bin and then out to out.bin. Um, so I've done that and so the first thing I'm going to do, uh, take a look at it in a hex editor. That's usually a pretty good start. So for, for a hex dump, so if I do hex dump dash c uh, out dot bin, um, no, and look at the top. So you can see a lot of interesting things from just the beginning of a ROM file. Sometimes it'll have comments, sometimes it'll have things. This one has a ZM at the beginning. So does anyone know what that might indicate? Well, I'll give you a hint. The first thing it indicates is I've got the even and the odd back. So if I, uh, if I switch it to Y1A8 and Y2A8, if I look at it again, it starts with an MZ. Does that ring a bell for anyone? It might not. It's okay if it doesn't. So that means this is a DOS program. Um, yeah. So, and it stands to reason that on an 8086 machine, they might have developed the firmware on a DOS machine, run as a DOS program, and transplanted it to a ROM and put the boot vectors and everything else in there. Uh, to make it run on the embedded system. So that actually gives us a number of useful things, including the fact that if it's a DOS program, it also, IDA knows how to load it into memory properly. 
Although, again, since it's also going to be running on bare metal on a different embedded machine, it might not do it properly. So, we run IDA. Um, we just started up, um, this is a fairly old version, but we start up, we give it the out.bin that we stitched together there. Uh, and it can already tell because of that MZ at the beginning, um, it's a common signature for a DOS executable file. Um, now, for the real analysis, it turned out I needed to load it as a binary file and manually superimpose the image because basically, as a DOS program, it gets loaded in a different area of memory in DOS than as the embedded program. But for the sake of simplicity, I'm going to just load this as a DOS program. It's going to create the segments, and it's going to rename things, um, and uh, you can give it other parameters, you can give it some arguments for changing some of the processor options and the analysis options and that sort of thing. Uh, I'm just going to proceed with the defaults for now because we only have another uh, four minutes. Um, uh, so and yeah, so this is saying it's possibly a packed file. It's saying that because there's some garbage at the end because that's where it passed out to get to the end of the ROM. Uh, but I'm just going to tell it to continue, um, and it's also telling me that as well. Um, so yes, sure, why not? So unfortunately, Ida likes a wider window than 80 by 24, but we're going to be able to see it. So you can see it's already mapped out a couple of the function things. It's told us that. 686 is not true, it's uh, definitely just 886, but it doesn't really hurt us now. Um, and it's giving us a whole bunch of useless information here. But here's the, the initialization code at start, and as you go up and down with the, uh, um, uh, through the code, it tells you where it is. It's automatically mapping locations that things jump to, and so you can see here that's the location name it gave, just prefixing it or postfixing it with the uh, address, and here's a cross-reference to it. So if you say, you know, hey, what are, you can bring up a window, or what are the cross-references, this only has the one. So um, you can start moving through the code that way. Um, you can see now, like, it calls subroutines. So you can jump to those subroutines, um, and it shows you all the places that this subroutine is called from. So that gets called by a couple of things. There's five of them. Um, and you can start moving uh, through there. So now, if I wanted to start digging deeper, I would want to find, again, the strings table. And since this is something with a substantial console uh, presence, it's got a lot of, what did I just do? That was the wrong one. Um, that's better. Alt H. <laughs> um, so I want to, I can go for a text search. And let's say I want to search for SCSI, because it's a SCSI card, and the console is always talking about SCSI. I get the string table. Um, and so there's lots of different things. So there's a mix of SCSI and um, DEC device names and other things here. And you'll notice right now it's not showing any cross references. And that's actually because as the, um, uh, as the DOS program, none of these get referenced. You actually have to start the analysis from the proper initialization vector for the bare metal for those to actually be seen properly. So, um, you know, that's. <coughs> Again, you have to start in the right place sometimes. But that's sort of the, the low-down intro. I have a couple minutes for, like, so the short story here, though, is I did end up fixing it. I found a place where I had accidentally bricked it because in when it's loaded the configuration from its EEPROM, uh, if you accidentally set the number of disks and tapes present on the device to zero, it crashed because it started out by pre-decrementing the number and looking for zero. And when you pre-decrement zero, you get 255, and uh, it just spun off into space and died. So not only was I able to find the problem and fix it by writing over the EEPROM, uh, I was also able to find some spare uh, space in right near there where there were some redundant instructions and write a check for that problem and fix it so I couldn't break it anymore. So there is a very concrete example of where disassembling this sort of thing can help a lot because I would not have been able to afford another one of these cards and I was not really looking forward to throwing it out. So, I have a couple minutes for questions. I know we're slightly delayed because the last one was delayed, but does anyone have questions? Otherwise, you're welcome to come see me. No, all right. Well, I told you everything you need to know then. Uh, all right, well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. I, uh,